It's been a few weeks now since we began our series today, which will continue. With your Bibles in hand, please turn with me now to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in the book of Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, as we continue building on the definition of what it means to be a covenant ministry partner here at Living Word Community Church. Our scripture focus today is going to uh, be a reminder of not only the, spirit, the significance of spiritual leadership, but also of the matter of accountability, which we'll, we'll be focusing on. In Hebrews 13, I'm going to read a few verses that I did not share with Seth. I'm going to start, I want us to look at the first few verses of chapter 13 and down through this. In this chapter... Uh, of the letter to the Hebrews, we find what's called uh, the, uh, an illustration of what it means to give our sacrifice to the Lord, what, what, uh, what sacrifice look, what sacrificial living looks like, uh, offering a sacrifice to, to the Lord. And he starts here in Hebrews 13 by saying, let brotherly love continue. And then he begins unpacking what that really means. He says here, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And then he says, remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Again, illustrative of what it means for us to let brotherly love continue. Next. Verse 4, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterers. Next, keep your life, life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Again, illustrative of what it means to let brotherly love continue. Verse 7, remember your leaders those who spoke to you the word of God, and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Verse 9, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace and not by foods which have not benefited those, who, those devoted to them. And he goes on in the next few verses to talk about a, an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Down in verse 15, we pick it up here in this passage. There, through him, through Christ, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. An acceptable sacrifice. Verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Next, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Verse, 19, uh, verse 18, rather. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. And I wanted to read that to set the, the epistemological context here in this chapter as the writer to the Hebrews, who is unnamed, uh, outline, outlines for us all what it means to offer a pleasing sacrifice. And it's within that context, and this is important, so within that context that we find the, spirit, the significance of spiritual leadership in the church and accountability to the spiritual leaders of the church. It was about 39 years ago that Pastor Alistair Begg made this comment to his congregation that's in Cleveland, Ohio, named Parkside Community Church. He said, one of the great lacks in our day is loyalty, a genuine commitment to another individual or task or group of people. In a confused society, a compromised church, and a Christianity that is shaky at best, the question of authority and loyalty is one of the most pressing issues of our day. There is never a world in greater need of leaders, men and women who know the way and can keep ahead and draw others to follow. End quote. If this is indeed true, if it was true 39 years ago, certainly 
it is no less true and pertinent today. Would you agree with that? It's true. It's pertinent today, just as it was 39 years ago when he said those things. And so as a local church, Living Word Community Church is, a, as we know, a fellowship of faithful Christian followers who have come together two years ago to form our congregation now, join hand in hand to honor the Lord Jesus, and to bring glory to God through our worship, through our ministry together, and through our life together as the body of Christ here in this place. And to achieve this requires a certain kind of loyalty. I'm going to use that word, loyalty, a genuine commitment, a genuine commitment, a faithfulness by demonstration where you're in, you're in, not just a bystander, but a participant. And with that in mind, and as we began building on this definition, what does it mean to be a covenant ministry partner of Living Word Community Church? Well, we began defining it a few weeks ago, first of all, by saying a covenant ministry partner is a person who has been born again by the power of God via the message of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16 and 17. Secondly, a covenant ministry partner is one who is growing in the grace and knowledge of God and in the imitation of Christ, 2 Peter three eighteen, Growing in the grace and knowledge of God and the imitation of Christ. And last week, thirdly, we considered this from Colossians, the book of Colossians, you recall. Covenant ministry partner is a person who is actively committed to this local fellowship, the, the local fellowship of the believers here. By that, I mean, again, not a bystander looking in through the windows, as it were, but one who is engaged in the life and the ministry of the church. Today, the fourth of these definitions is this. Covenant ministry partner is one who is willing to be accountable to the spiritual leaders of the church. And this message, in a way, is is hanging on to the tail, if you will, of the final message from the preceding series, which was uh, defining what what it means to be in community. It's a shepherded community. If you remember back in August, that message was the last of that series. And this message will kind of ring true with that one in in a lot of ways because we're going to look at this matter of leadership in the church. And when you think about the matter of accountability, the word accountability, children, if left to their own devices, really resist being accountable People in general in our society don't take kindly to the word accountability. Why? Because we want to be autocratic. We want to have our autonomy. We, we don't want to be, uh, you know, have to report in or, you know, we have the, these ideas. And some people would go as far as to suggest that to, to infer accountability is, is somehow some sort of a, a church-based control mechanism. Like, we're trying to control your life. We're snooping around your property when you're not home. Years ago, (laughs) that would happen, believe it or not. People would snoop around. Not here. That's not what we mean at all. It is not some sort of another synonym for spiritually guys surveillance. (laughs) We're not talking about that. I set that aside. However, if we're to understand it, the word accountability from a biblical point of view, we can quickly see how essential accountability is to the health and the vitality and the well-being of the church, the body of Christ, which speaks directly then to the health and the vitality and the well-being of every single ministry that we have here. Accountability. We serve. We serve with humility. We commit. We, we show up. We're faithful. We're dependable. We're, we're honest. We're sincere. I mean, all of those things are part and parcel of it all, if you're unpacking the word. And so accountability to one another and to the spiritual leadership team, the spiritual leaders of the congregation, the pastor, the elders, the deacons, in our case, we encompass those things, who carry the responsibility of watching over and caring for you as a body, as a church body, is, is really essential for us to function with vitality and, and healthy well-being for the church and the ministry of the church. So as we look at two particular verses here in this chapter, we're going to look at verse 7 and then verse 17. And there's two particular things I want us to focus on. The first is the profile of leadership. And the second is the profitability of being led. 
The profile of leadership. Let's, let's look at that. Verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God, and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, the New Living Translation of the Bible renders this verse in this way. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of all the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. Now, two words we can lift up there. First of all, the idea of following, it literally could be the word imitate. Imitate that. Follow them. And the word example is the Greek word that we get our term pattern. Like, how many of you ladies used to sew with a pattern? Anybody sew with a pattern? Like dresses, you know. No, none of the younger girls raised their hand here. Maybe Sabrina. And younger. I, I'm older. You're younger, many of you. Anyway, but the pattern, it used to be a pattern. My mom used to have a pattern, you know, to make a dress or to make an apron or, or something like that. And the pattern was this paper, sort of had a pattern printed on it, and she would take straight pins Remember, and put it on the material and cut it out. Connie's shaking her head. She, know, you know, she knows exactly what I'm talking about. My grandmother would do this, make, make stuff all the time by hand. Sewing, get the sewing machine out, you know, do all that. The pattern. Why was the pattern essential? Because otherwise you weren't making a dress, you were making a pair of trousers or something, even if you didn't want to, right? So you, the pattern. So it's that word. It's the pattern. Follow the pattern. Imitate the pattern. Imitate the example of their faith. And with that said, let's consider this. The responsibility of leadership, first of all. The responsibility of leadership. We see it here uh, sort of in, there's five things that I'd like to draw our attention to. The responsibility of leadership. First of all, leaders are faithful to the word of God. That's number one. The responsibility of leadership. Faithful to the word of God. Now, with that said, if you care to, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. We're going to look at just a couple of book verses with each of these as we go along. But first of all, 1 Timothy 4.13 is regarding the, their faithfulness to the word of God. Paul says to Timothy, his son, his protege, his son in the faith, until I come, Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. And remember, if you know 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, this is right, it talks about the, the nature of Scripture, is it profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, and training in righteousness, those verses, that's what he's driving at there. Now, if you turn over to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, first of all, 2 Timothy 1, 13, 2 Timothy 1, 13, Paul says here, and uses this word, follow the pattern of, Example, example, follow the pattern of the sound words you have heard from me, Timothy, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Over in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Follow the pattern. Follow the pattern, and then not only follow it, but then pass it on. Pass it on. Just uh, two, two Friday mornings ago in our Bible study, we were talking about two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, who were ministry partners of the Apostle Paul. We were looking at the, the letter to the Philippians. At the end of that, I really felt in my heart like to ask the question of the, of the men, who's your Timothy? Who's your Timothy? We know Paul talks about Lois and Eunice. And Paul and Tim, we have Paul and Timothy, Lois, Eunice, those examples. Who's your Timothy, men? Who's your Timothy? Why do I ask that? Why is that important? Who's your Timothy? Well, because if you don't have a Timothy, chances are you're not passing that faith on to someone who will in turn pass it on to someone else, a la 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. You follow me? And what, what happens? If we don't have a Timothy, if, ladies, you don't have a Eunice, Lois, Eunice, if you don't have that person, ladies, then the chain of, of discipleship fails at that moment. At that point, there's no carrying on. There's no passing along of. And, you know, and I don't mean to overlook the importance of parents teaching your children, little Timothys, little Eunices and Lois, that group. Do that. Pass that on. If you don't do it, nobody else is doing it. You follow what I'm saying? And so we bring that. We parlay this thing, this concept, principally into this. 
we understand how vitally important that is. So the first responsibility is that they're faithful to the Word of God. Secondly, they are to be exemplary. Leaders are to be exemplary in their way of life, their way of life. So with that said, a couple of verses. First of all, looking at Philippians 3, 17. Philippians 3, 17. Paul says to the church there in Philippi, Philippians 3.17 says, brothers and sisters in Christ, join in imitating me, in imitating me, following my example, in other words, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. The, the example, the example of the leaders. Paul was the apostolic leader. Timothy was his protege. Titus was a protege. Other people like Epaphroditus, Silas, others like that. Follow the example. Follow. Walk in accordance with that example. Another letter we could look at would be back in earlier in the in New Testament in First Corinthians. Now, First Corinthians, chapter ten, at the very end of chapter ten. First Corinthians ten, verse thirty-two, and into chapter eleven, verse one, where Paul says, "Give no offense." to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, Paul then says, as I am of Christ. What Paul was not saying was, I'm great, follow me. He's saying, Jesus is great, let's follow him. Follow me as I follow Christ, and I'm saying that to you. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'm trying to follow Jesus. I'm not perfect. Those of you who know me know how true that is. I am not perfect. I'm a man, and I have faults and shortcomings. Follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus forgives. He cleanses. He he honors those that strive to follow him. Be exemplary. Leaders are to be exemplary in our way of life. We are called to lead by our example. Indeed, in Peter's first letter, chapter 5, again, these well-known words I've reiterated a few times. 1 Peter 5, he says to the elders there, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, listen, not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example or examples to the flock. It's essential for the leader in that regard. Be exemplary. Thirdly, they are to be also exemplary in their walk of faith. Paul said in Ephesians 4.1, he said, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Ephesians 4.1. And so just as children will imitate the behaviors and habits and attitudes of their parents, particularly the little ones as they're coming up, believe me, they have your eye, their eyes on you, mom and dad, believe me, and guess what happens? The things you pray they'll never ever say in public, they do. Sometimes they act in a certain way and it's like, man, I wish she or he would have never said or done that. Because that's like, wow, man, I hope nobody understands. Guess what? They're mimicking. They mimic. They follow. Children do that. They follow your behaviors. They follow the habits of life that you have set as parents, the attitudes of their parents. And oftentimes, I think believers in the church in general will imitate the leadership team, will imitate the, the priorities of the leader, the heart of the leader, and so forth, for better or for worse, let's just say. They watch to see how their leaders will speak and act, the attitudes of the leaders' hearts, the the priorities of the leaders' lives as they demonstrate those priorities as family family men uh, or what have you, just in general terms. Everyone who's in a position of spiritual leadership in the congregation is called to be a living example of faithfulness, commitment, and devotion to Jesus Christ, full stop. First, above everything else, First of all, and to fail in that regard, I believe, is a failure to uphold the responsibility that we have as a leader. If you fail there, you have failed in that regard. And it may result in the removal of your responsibilities if you fail. Fourthly, a leader, the responsibility, they must be faithful as a shepherd, faithful as shepherds of the congregation. And here, in fact, it's interesting because in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, it refers to Jesus as the great shepherd of the sheep. 
Peter's letter, 1 Peter 5, talks about he's, he's the, uh, the chief shepherd. Jesus said of himself in John chapter 10, I'm the good shepherd. So you have this idea, this idea of shepherding, the shepherd, shepherd of the flock. If you look here at Hebrews 13, 17, just the first phrase or so, of that verse, it says here, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls. And the New Living Translation renders that text this way. It says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls. They're accountable to God. To watch over your souls. Now, back in the, in the prophecy of Ezekiel, I'm just going to read these couple of verses. Just sit tight. Ezekiel chapter 3, in verses 16 and 17, we find this essential example of the watch care, the watchfulness, the, the calling to be a watchman, if you will. Ezekiel 3. God has called Ezekiel. He's revealed him, his glory to Ezekiel. And, and he's just over, he says, I sat there overwhelmed, he says, by the Kabar Canal. Verse 16. At the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning from me. And then he goes on to caution Ezekiel to be sure to convey God's word to the people, even if it's a, even if it's a word of challenge or rebuke. To not do so would hold Ezekiel accountable. You follow me? And so as a watchman, I feel that. For you, and when I have a when the Lord puts something on my heart for the church, and I, I can so remember the past twenty years, I've, there's been many a Sunday when I had a, a burden in my spirit, and I would say to Lori before we'd leave the house, "This is going to be a hard message today for the church," and it was. But I didn't. I wasn't relinquished from the responsibility to say that, was I? Lest I be like Ezekiel. And to be held accountable. So there's, a, there's an incumbent responsibility. Here, the shepherd is called to be a watchman, a, a sentry. And I, and I see that uh, kind of spilling over into our elders and deacons and as collective, collective leaders of the church here. We have that responsibility to shepherd, to stand in the post, to be a sentry on the wall, to, to watch over the church, to protect, to protect the church. And finally... A leader, the fifth quality here of the responsibility would be this, that they are to be devoted to their work. Devoted to their work. <clears throat> That's, we can look here qu very quickly at 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13, he says here, Paul writes, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Because of their work. So the shepherd is called to be devoted to their work. The, the leaders are to be called to their work, to be faithful, devoted to their work. The task of spiritual leadership is, first of all, to point people to Jesus Christ as Lord. It is never to say, hey, follow me. Let's, let's coalesce a whole big group. Let's all go there. When he, then we're all going to go over here. Now we're all going to move south to Florida or wherever. You know. No, the, the responsibility I have is, first and foremost, to point people to Christ. And that's it. And we're doing it together. The next thing that we look at as we consider this whole matter of the, the profile of the leader, or the portrait of the leader, rather, is the accountability now, the accountability of leadership, the accountability. And for this, we're going to look here again, more particularly at verse 17, the accountability of leadership. He says here, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account, have to give an account. They're accountable to God. Okay, so think about this. Now, in, interestingly, in just the past few months, three well-known, nationally recognized, prominent pastors have resigned or been dismissed from their positions in the church. And they all come from the Dallas-Fort Worth area, which is striking to me. Tony Evans... Stephen Lawson, and most recently, Robert Morris of Gateway Church. 
So you have Tony Evans, who was the founding pastor of what's called Oak Cliff Bible Church. Prominent. Stephen Lawson, Trinity Bible Church. Prominent. Associated not with not only in Dallas there at that church, but also the director of the Doctor of Ministry program at the Master Seminary where John MacArthur is the pastor and leader of that. And lastly, Gateway Church, Robert Morris. This, this church has a $100 million annual budget. It's global. Global. In each of these instances, these men confessed years after the fact of some sort of an inappropriate relationship or wrongdoing with a woman. And, that, and they were dismissed. And I'm bringing that out because they're in, in the position as a pastor. These, these men are like what we think of as A-list. Or like they're, they're like the kind of people you see on the TV, on some big forum. They have a huge platform by the thousands of people kind of stuff. But there's an accountability that falls to them, just as it does to me here. And we're not thousands here, right? But the same thing holds true. And so when it says here in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls for those who, as those who will have to give an account. The writer here is, is asserting something important. He says, this is a word of reminder for us, just as it was for them. It's a word of reminder telling us that those who are called to positions of spiritual leadership in the church, right, not only need to give an account to the congregation, but they will ultimately need to give an account for the church, not just to the church. And I can assure you that the second one is far more sobering to me than is the first. I'll give an account to y'all any day of the week, but I better really think twice about what it means to stand before Almighty God and give an account for you, you as I will. That is it, it's hemispherically different in, in seriousness. You follow me? And so we're talking about accountability. Let's unpack that idea just a bit more. We'll give an account for every word spoken, for every attitude shown, for every word of counsel given, for every word of correction or edification asserted, for every example shown or set, because each one of these is squarely laid on the shoulders of those who are called to shepherd and lead the congregation, as am I, as our leaders now. And so do you feel the weight of it? Can you feel the weight of this? This is weighty stuff and it's important stuff. So as the pastoral shepherd of this congregation, along with our elders and deacons, we refuse to, because of that responsibility, we refuse to allow those who are under the charge of the leadership team to, to, to sacrifice the ultimate best, which is the, the glory and purpose and, and majesty of God Almighty, first of all, in, in all priorities of life, for the immediate pursuits of life, which are so alluring. It's like the low-hanging fruit. It's like the low-hanging fruit of your life. Man, it, man we, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's go here. Let's do that. Let's do, get involved in all these other things, and all those other things are not inherently evil or bad. None of those things are most, for the most part, right? But what happens? They, become to, they steal your time. They steal your energy. They steal everything. They rob you of the opportunity of committing yourself earnestly and wholeheartedly to the things of God, which are ultimately the best. Ultimately the best. Even the best, most well-paid professional athlete you can think of today, when they stand before Almighty God, how much is that going to be worth in value before God? Zero. Zero. All the wealth, all the big barns, all this time, money, energy, striving after all of those kinds of things, no matter what it is, will account to zero eternally. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That's a treasure. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Because they are eternal. Amen? So that's what we're... So as a leader, we feel that responsibility. And we, we call you to that. And so therefore, we're called to make difficult and sometimes unpopular statements or d decisions as a team. As a team, excuse me, that uh, tend at times be misconstrued or misunderstood. And, and, and even challenged outright 
by people in the congregation because they, they take it wrong or they don't understand or they don't, maybe they just don't like to be challenged. They don't want to be accountable. But guess what? We've done so because we have prayerfully sought and embraced the vision for the church that God has laid upon our hearts. And we're going to say it. We're going to tell you. If that's what the Lord has put on our that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. And we're, we're doing so because we're serving God. We're serving the Lord Jesus on your behalf. I can assure you that. That's the heart of our team. So we looked at the portrait of a leader, the responsibility of leadership, the accountability of leadership, and let's shift gears just a tad and talk about the profitability of being led. Again, verse 17, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no value to you, no advantage. No, it wouldn't be profitable for you. I'm using that word. The profitability of being led. The profitability of being led. Now, if you care to, you can look over with me at Titus, letter to Titus, chapter 1. Profitability of being led. Let them do this with joy, he says, and not with groaning. Profitability of being led. Titus 1, I'm going to pick up in verse 9. Is speaking about the qualifications for elders. Paul entrusted this responsibility to Titus. He said of the elder, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, why is that important? Well, he says, verse 10, for there are many <laughs> who are insubordinate in empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party, they must be silent since they are upsetting whole families and teaching for shame will gain what they ought not to teach. So a shepherd who is earnest in his shepherding will not allow this, the flock to be harmed by this stuff. And that's why. Down further in verse 13, he says their testimony is true in terms of the Cretans there. He's on the island of Crete. Therefore, rebuke them. Rebuke these people as described there in verses 10 and 11. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in their faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands, commands of people who turn away from the truth, etc., etc. They're detestable. I mean, it's, it's all of that. And it's a, pretty, it's a pretty interesting way to describe this stuff. It's serious stuff. There are many who are insubordinate. What does that mean? You know, if you're the owner of a business, if you're a boss, you know, what does it mean if your employees are insubordinate? People around you are insubordinate. What does it mean if your children are insubordinate? How does that look? How does that show up? Well, they just won't, they're disobedient. They won't, re, they won't listen. They, won't, they do what they want to do. They run amok. They're insubordinate. They don't respect authority. Yours or anyone else's for that matter, right? So it's about that whole thing. These people are insubordinate, as Paul said to Titus. And so when we apply this now to the matter of prof the profitability of being led by the congregation, by the pastor, as a pastor for over 20 years, I can assure you and tell you that people in the church who undermine and resist and subvert the leadership of the church are the most disheartening and disabling to a pastor's ministry. I've heard the same lament from many of my fellow colleagues who are also pastors in Greencastle now. And, uh, and elsewhere, for that matter. Same thing. People in the church who disdain you, people in the church who refuse to allow you to lead them or actually subvert openly or covertly your character as a pastor, shake your hand, going out to church, and stab you in the back on the, at the same, with the other hand. People who do that, they're not only toxic, they're caustic and dangerous, and they're disabling to the ministry of the church. Why? Because they're attacking the shepherd. And that's serious in God's sight. It's accountability. And this is why we have set out this fourth quality as we do in this definition, this unfolding definition of what it means to be a covenant ministry partner at Living Word Community Church, a person who is willing to be accountable to the spiritual leaders of the church. And I would even say furthermore accountable to one another in the church. Because there's a time when a brother needs to go to another brother. And it's not leader to, to non-leader stuff. It's just brother to brother, sister to sister stuff. Accountability. 
And it says there in verse 17, let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would not be profitable. It would be of no advantage to you. So I'm going to leave you with two takeaways here. Two takeaways. First of all, your attitude towards the spiritual leaders matters greatly. Your attitude towards us matters greatly. If you're struggling to understand why we're doing something or what's going on, come and talk with us. Give us the opportunity. Give us grace and be patient with us because we hold you in our hearts. That's what he says here in verse 18 of this passage. Pray for us for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. We hold you in our hearts. Give us an opportunity to explain. Hold. So check that, right? The second thing is your prayers on our behalf are not only meaningful, but they're profitable for all that we do, our life and our ministry together. I just recently have had a couple of people specifically say something to me that really was uplifting and encouraging for me to hear, and I appreciate that. And I'm not looking for compliments, but it's, when they happen, it's, it's pretty nice, you know, to hear those kinds of things. But praying for me, praying for our team, praying for our leaders. Rod said, let's pray for the team that's, that's working through this, the pastoral search process. Significant. This is foundational, friends. A willingness to walk in accountability with each other under the lordship of Christ is indeed essential to our life and our vitality as a ministry here at Living Word Community Church, I can't implore you enough to join in with us in this regard because we want to welcome each other to speak into our lives, as some would say, right? Speak into our lives. We want, we want each other to be able to have this kind of a open-hearted, familial kind of a sense in the body of Christ where we can go to each other as a brother in Jesus and sister in Christ and have have those opportunities to speak into, care for, encourage, uplift, comfort, console, uh, you know, any and all of those kinds of things. Give counsel when sought and so forth. Calling one another up, as Paul writes in Ephesians 4, to maturity as we pursue the maturity that we have in Jesus Christ. That is what we're going. That's, that's our heart's cry. That's, that's, my per, that's my personal desire for us here as a body, as a church. We just trust in the Lord to, to show us the way and to guide our steps in, as, in the coming months and as a new pastor is going to join the team and be part here and how that's going to look and the transition that's going to re- require of us, all of those things. So... Let's be in prayer. And today we're going to do something as we come to the conclusion. It, we're going to share communion together. The table of the Lord is, is a significant moment. We're going to come together and it's as the body of Christ to commemorate and to remember the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And today is Worldwide Communion Sunday and, and there are believers all over the world today uh, who are coming together around the table of the Lord in their local setting, just as we will now in a few minutes. And we, we've asked the, the older group of kids, which are the real young kids in elementary age, to, be, to come back in and just see, be witness to the communion service that we're going to have now. So as we move into prayer, I ask our leaders to come up here and join me, and we we'll go to prayer. I ask you to bow your heads. Leaders, you can, guys can come on up here. As we pray together. Father in heaven, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are Lord of the church and that your plan and purposes are, are the utmost importance to us here. We, it is our aim, Father God, to, in all things, bring you honor and glory, to proclaim your name, to, to proclaim your gospel throughout the earth, to, to be faithful in every ministry that we undertake or envision. Lord God, we realize that we are not perfect people. And at times, despite our desire earnestly to want to, <laughs> in, a, in a complete perfect sense, uh, attain these things, Lord, sometimes we just stumble a bit along the way. But Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord God, to nonetheless get up with your help, and move forward, pressing into your heart, 
striving after the things that you called us to be here at Living Word Community Church. Thank you, Lord God, for the work that you are doing, for the things that you are accomplishing in our midst as a church body. Today, as we turn our now our attention and of our hearts and minds to the, uh, the bread and the cup, the, the, the celebration and remembrance of your body broken and your blood shed at Calvary, for our sins, Lord, help us to do so sober-mindedly. Help us, Lord, to do so with a, an understanding that calls for a, an examination of heart and soul and mind to come with clean hands. And thank you, Lord God, for the, for the many, many unnumbered numbers of believers all over the earth, earth today who will do the very thing that we're about to do now as a representation, a symbol of all that you accomplished, that so much more than we could ever imagine, Lord, providing salvation for the believers. Thank you, Lord God, for your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.